I want to welcome you to this seminar called Nurturing Change. Uh, it's organized as part of the Ice Hot Nordic Dance Platform here in Helsinki, and it's live streamed through the Ice Hot YouTube channel. And it will also be later available as a recording on the Ice Hot website. Um, and I'd like to now hand over to uh, the moderator of today, Satu Herral. Please. Thank you very much, Katarina. Thank you for um, facilitating this space. Thank you, everyone, who are here and listening. And for Ice Hot to inviting us. And special thanks for Goethe Institute. Uh, <laughs> Petra is here from Goethe Institute. Thank you for supporting this event. Also, Goethe Institute London <coughs> and Helsinki. So, um, my name is Satu Herrala, and um, I have a pleasure and honor to have Virve Sutinen and Tang Fuquen here with me. Mm. And uh, we have a panel called Nurturing Change, and I would like to... We will talk about change and art relationship to change and transformation. And we will see how, where the conversation goes. But I would like to begin um, by um, introducing our guests here. So I start with Virve. So Virve Sutinen, uh, artistic director of Tansim August Festival in Berlin, uh, and a pioneer and a champion of performing arts, dance, international networks and mobility. You are a founding member of, of European Dance House Network uh, and Ice Heart Nordic Platform also, as well as a co-founder of experimental festivals like Theatre Now and Herb Festival here in Helsinki. Uh, you have also served as uh, a president of IETM and artistic director of Dance House in, Stock in Stockholm and Kiasma Theatre in Helsinki among other things. Welcome, Virve. <laughs> so, here we have Tang Fu Quen, um, artistic director of Taipei Arts Festival, and uh, soon to be a director of BIT Theater Graschen in Bergen. So, it's a pleasure to welcome you in the region. Yeah, you have an ext extensive experience as a curator for performing arts and visual arts, including Tokyo Performing Arts me Meeting, Singapore Arts Museum, Exodus Festival, In Transit Festival, Haus de Kultur de Welt, December Dance, Bangkok Prince Festival, and the Singaporean Pavilion uh, in the 53rd Venice Biennial, among others. And for many, you are really like a bridge between uh, the performing arts scenes in uh, Asia and Europe. So, really wonderful to have you here. Yeah, and both, um, yeah, both of you like are people who, uh, from whom I, I'm like always eager to learn from. So, I'm really happy to be here. And another person who I love to learn from, uh, Eva Nekleva, unfortunately, cannot be here. Uh, today, wonderful uh, curator and, and friend, but unfortunately uh, Eva was not able to come. Um, yes, so let's begin um, with the first question. Thinking about change, um, I would like to ask you both to think back on an encounter with art that have changed something in you that has been that has made like a shift of perspective that has been transformative in some ways if you can recall a moment and i invite you also while you're thinking about this everyone listening if you can also uh, connect back to that moment uh, or one of those moments for yourself, like something that really stayed with you, um, an encounter with an artwork of any kind of artwork that has uh, 
has been a catalyst for change for you personally? Um, many moments, too many moments, but let's say, you know, my memory has, you know, merged many of these moments. So I can only say that uh, when I first uh, traveled by myself outside of Singapore, where I grew up and was educated in, um, in around um, 90, Five ninety six. I started to travel uh, during summer holidays to New York, London, all these big metropolitan cities in hungry search of contemporary art and wanting to s finally see things beyond the textbook names, right, that I was raised in. And um, soon I started to ask, like, how I'm connected to these uh, spectacles that I was watching, you know, you know, because growing up in a period um, um, when you know in in the education system, which is highly uh, you know colonized by Western thinking, uh, I was raised uh, very anglophilic, uh, very uh, uh, in admiration of things Western. So, you know, uh, you know, uh, unbeknownst to myself, I was actually already trying to reproduce or mimic, you know, what is in the West, right? So I started to see on stage all these uh, classic uh, artists uh, and their spectacles, and, and soon I started to realize, oh, maybe I'm not so connected to them, <laughs> you know? They don't really speak about me. <laughs> Who am I? Uh, where I come from, and so I started also to study what else is presented from my part of the world. Yeah, you know, like uh, what is it that we see representing um, Asia, let's say Asia at large. Yeah, and soon I found out that they were always the same companies, the big companies from um, Taiwan, right? Cloud Gate. Uh, theatre, uh, the Butoh, you know, Butoh was so big in the 90s and the rage, right? And, um, and, and uh, oh, drumming, you know, these drumming companies. So, so, uh, so then I thought like, ooh, these uh, representations don't really also speak to me, right? Um, so then I was in a crisis of sorts. Um, I thought that I, uh, stories or um, expressions and, and narratives uh, from my generation were not being seen or not being uh, uh, presented. So then, uh, very interestingly, I then went into a whole education, and it was really education by observation and critique. You know, and soon I realized that, ah, there are all these production systems in the West that are just fetishizing, consuming certain kinds of representations that represent a certain maybe romantic ideal image or certain stereotype which I didn't connect to. Yeah, so I think um, this, uh, these, uh, let's say like this collection of moments of <gasps> revelation that I am invisible, or my generation is invisible in, on so-called global stage that I started to uh, realize that, no, I won't go study in New York. No, I actually got a scholarship to NYU, and I said, no. Yeah. And, I, and I said, I'm going to Berlin. Right? And then when I was in Berlin, I realized, oh, no, I'm not German. You know, I'm not so German. I don't think, uh, you know, I'm just such an uh, uh, oddball in that system. Right? So I said, no. <laughs> so then I headed back home. Uh, and, and then I realized I had to connect to my own people, my own neighborhood, my, my colleagues, and my generation to, to ask what are the important things and representations that we have to make uh, as a response to what is missing or invisibilized. Yeah. 
So this, I would say, you know, I, of course, in this entire narrative, uh, you can you can see that it's a kind of like a, a, a decolonial awakening. And indeed, then for my uh, for my dissertation, I was I was also reading up a lot, and and you know, in those days, your teachers were not even, you know, really um, schooled in that kind of language. So to find my own um, uh, uh, vocabulary and to 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 kind of read and 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 to kind of critique uh, in my own way was was a really let's say not easy process. I was often lost with not very many guiding signposts, but I guess along the way in these years it became clearer and clearer. And then I dedicated my mission to cultivating, nurturing. Uh, a, a generation of uh, contemporary artists uh, of my uh, generation, uh, with whom I could have dialogues with, you know. So, so I think uh, the consequence uh, has become more evident in the last ten years. It takes quite a while. This whole entire process, let's say, this I think was was really like the the spark, this uh, trigger to 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 set a mission to set uh, uh, really an ideological agenda, <laughs> if I may be so big to say. But in those days, you know, it was more intuitive. You don't put words like, oh, I want to you know, be decolonial. It's not like that. You just feel like, ah, you know, something is missing. What is this? I sense it and I must address it. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful. And also want to say that, yes, uh, it's so visible and clear in your work also, like this moment. Like it's good to trace back those moments and then like to see like, like oh, that, that, that's been a guiding force for you, that, that realization, that like decolonial awakening. Yeah. And Virve, what yeah. about you? Well, I think, I think it's true that those early experiences are quite decisive. Um, and you're kind of like tracking some of those experiences that changed your thinking or just somehow awakened you, that you look for those things and you can name them later. Um, but if I think like what really has uh, kind of like affected me maybe is when there has been, like I'm looking at the ballet pictures over there and like a little bit disturbed by them and I'm thinking like, okay, so I went from a ballet girl to, to a punk and and squatting and you know being really tough little cookie and and i think what 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 in punk was was that it was engaging it was a movement it was a cultural movement it was a community it was a global community and and it was really um kind of participatory before it was totally commercialized and you know the bands went on on the high stand but before we were like on the floor together and this kind of experience for me was like, oh, you know, art can be like this. It can be like there's a low threshold. You can do it yourself. It's very accessible in some ways. It has it has like a revolutionary power, even if it didn't know, really know where it was going. But I think like uh, for the rest of my life, I've been w looking for that kind of kind of kind of things. It kind of just that experience really framed. Um, and being here in Cable Factory, I immediately was thinking, okay, Cable Factory was a really important place because I saw Studio Uber History here uh, of uh, Sanna Kekkelainen. And this was, of course, the kind of work which few saw. There was like a few benches where the restaurant is now, and, and the critic stormed out of the performance, banging the door. You know, there's like kind of a scandal. But it was something also that had that energy that I recognized, and I was like, finally, I was like, okay, this, there is even in this dance form, which is my first way of expressing myself, there's also this kind of energy, um, which is kind of like uh, going over and renewing itself through uh, kind of a, um, energy and, and uh, willingness to throw yourself in it and, and push the boundaries. Um, so I think for the for, for me, that, that kind of things happen every maybe five or ten years, that you, you meet something that renews your thinking. And I think of what often it is for me, it is the, the relationship. If I think of myself as a programmer or a curator, it is about the relationship between the audience and the artwork. And um, 
and, and those are the moments when like it really hits me, you know, going to um, uh, Parc de la Villette in 90, uh, Mickey is not here, but it was like 90s. We went there for the one of the first rencontres urbaines, and we see thousand kids with like immigrant backgrounds flocking into theater and screaming to the to the performers, like like being in that kind of like dialogue with the audience. And you were, all, of course, immediately I was like, okay, we are again at the source of this kind of energy that will that will affect us and our practices for the next 10 years. And there's always that kind of waves. So for me, that's kind of like what I'm always looking for. Even maybe that's why academia didn't really, <laughs> didn't really feel like the right place. Even I went to New York and I did my studies there. Um, but, um, and I can, you know, you can do the, the academic language, but at the same time, there is that kind of experience of art that really um, moves you internally and you know, this is why art is so dangerous, isn't it? <laughs> because it really has that power. And and when art becomes too safe and too, you know, redefined or too boxed and, you know, too much, like, um, aware of its, its, its own strategies, I think it just sometimes loses that power for change. Because I think there is a bit of a chaos always in a change. There's that unpredictability. There's that kind of, that, that, energy that can change things, which we are sometimes afraid and, and, and because we cannot really name it yet. I mean, that comes later, like the realization, as you were saying, like afterwards you understood, thankfully, what you were after. And I also it took, I mean, now I'm so old that I'm like, oh my God, what a long way. And I'm still talking about the experiences that I had when I was like 17, 16, 17. Um, but it, it really, um, like when you think of dance, um, I think uh, my mission for when I work with dance came from that source. Like, okay, first of all, uh, work in the in a context where I can somehow try to initiate that kind of change. It's always limit. There's always limits to that when you work in institutions and and even if it's a festival. But then try to really put my mind and my intelligence in trying to like what is what are the strategies how you can be like keep up with that somehow. Um, and at the same time, of course, there's other missions when you work institutionally, you have to maintain, you have to sustain, you have to, you know, keep, uh, keep, keep the audience happy also. And, you know, because they are our best defenders in the political arena. No, there's a lot of other things that come, but then there is this, this heart that is beating for, for, for something else. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, that's great. Also this like, this is, uh, yeah, good to go back to the, the punk roots or <laughs> your punk roots, like, uh, and also see the trajectory of that, you know, like, and the, those moments of, like, I see, like, where the, er the herb festival also, like, <laughs> came, came, like, like, was sor also sourced somehow, like, um, yeah. Yeah, then, then maybe from this personal like th there's already so much coming out that um we will discuss we will go back to and discuss uh, like yeah i want to discuss like awakening the colonial awakening or energy like i want to discuss energy because it's very uh key in thinking about change um but let's just stick with this question of transformative moments and or transformative processes also maybe just go not just moments because I see that it's like it's not an event it's a process also like for, for both of you there's not like one event or maybe there are many uh, singular events but it's more like a, a process and then I'd like to ask about something that you witnessed um, in an art context um, maybe it was a program that you were involved with uh, as a curator for example or some or uh, working with an artist for example um, so it was like in relation or in relation to the audience like you said uh, brought audience there we um, like if if you want to share a transformative moment when you see that that it's a collective change. There's a collective change. Um, maybe it's already there is a collect 
activity already to to your examples, but um, do you understand the question? Like to think about the kind of moment where you witnessed a collective change. Yeah, something, a shift, or a shift. Um. Yeah, I did. Yes, <laughs> please. When, Ur when Urban Festival, be, when we did the graffiti happening, then, I, then the change started from there. The kind of like uh, uh, starting to build legal places for painting, um, changing the, the rules and regulations of the city, the political uh, uh, discussions that followed it, which initiated the change. So you can, you, th it's, it's still possible to trigger something in this society so that it gets upset and then it actually starts a process of changing. That's, that's like my only clear, uh, clear um, um, uh, case but I'm, I'm sure there is others that we are not aware of. Like, like we put when we work so long and in so many trades, like maybe things just started moving that way and you don't realize it. But sometimes the things are very practical, very clear. Illegal to paint graffiti in Helsinki, then legal. So there you can see like a real shift in the policies of the city um, and in the whole field of, of the painters, of course, because it's, it, it created a whole other culture of like openness and and visibility and, and becoming part of the art world and becoming part of the urban landscape in Helsinki. Yeah, that, that, yeah, that's um, that's a very concrete like from 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 like an uh, project or even an event to policy, like actually like a city policy, uh, and uh, also move like movement, like or movement was there must have been there already, but the kind of strengthening of the movement like among people who were doing graffiti or like that growing that movement uh, when was that actually like where around 2000 and 2001 uh, when it was illegal in Helsinki but because I was working in Kiasma Museum of Contemporary Art um, and actually the land that the museum is built on is owned by the state not by the city so the city could not tell us uh, could not deny us doing something on our own, 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 own piece of land. So this created the possibility to do a 120 meters long wall where, we, where there was a painting happening starting um, at a certain hour and like 30, 30 painters starting to paint at the same time. Um, and yeah, and that, that makes it made, it made it possible. Yeah, thank you. And that the people who worked at the museum were supportive and didn't bend under the pressures from the politicians and from the police and the authorities. This is very important. And this is, this is why institutions are sometimes good. I mean, they are not always the best things for change, but they can also protect, um, protect the, the, the change sometimes. Yeah, when they take a really clear stand uh, with something. Um. Pukwen, do you have uh, something you would like mm. to s share, like a collective? Mm. Um, In my recollection, I... I I have to say, I, and also maybe I'm a, a little bit embarrassed to say that I grew up in such an ch unchanging, stable country like Singapore <laughs> that I never once uh, experienced something radical, like a revolutionary, so to speak, that uh, s could singularly trigger uh, a reaction. Uh, to date, I have never ever participated in protest <laughs> because um, it just doesn't exist. <laughs> you know, uh, there are all kinds of laws and regulations that clamp down protests. An assembly of two persons is considered uh, illegal without permission, <laughs> without public permission. If the police comes along and say, why are you two persons sitting in a public space uh, can you explain why? And if you don't give a good enough reason, they can, they have the right to bring you to the police station. So, so this kinds of, uh, you know, uh, let's say like uh, I've been very much sheltered in 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 this kind of uh, environment, um, which of course then leads me always into a kind of projected empathy <laughs> with people who who. Embro who have to be embroiled and because their stick are so high that they have to present themselves in these moments uh, uh, asking for change. You know? 
So, of course, needless to say, the, the last uh, big um, um, change in Hong Kong, right, the, uh, during which I was not able to be present, uh, uh, really um, saddened me very, very much. But uh, my heart was uh, very much uh, shaking, and 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 with my 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 friends and colleagues and actually family members in Hong Kong. So so, I I guess you know when when you don't have these kinds of direct experience or, or first hand accounts. Uh, an embodied, an embodied stake. Uh, I, 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 I often, you know, it can be a gift and also a, a, a blind spot that you where you project your empathy. You know, you 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 get, uh, you try to s get into the situation uh, of those who are suffering or in in uh, who are victimized. Uh, and then you ask, uh, how, what am I supposed to do? So often I think uh, I've, I've been caught in such a bind. Um, it can be good in that then I, I, I you know, I give, I give when I, I can intuitively sense that uh, there's justice to be called for. The, the change should be addressed. Uh, and it can be a blind spot because sometimes you over project, right? Because you were not part of it. It's imaginary. You, you think, oh, you know, uh, you become idealistic, right? And, and sometimes that idealism is also can be also positive because you, 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 you. I, I think uh, I, I ask myself, like, you know, like um, we're also like in, in the Philippines, you know, during the pandemic. You know, an artist that I work very closely with, Isa uh, Hoxson, and her uh, and her artists were making a work that was supposed to premiere in my festival, and then suddenly they said, "Oh, this is going entirely. You know, this whole show is going to change its premise, its form, and we are going to do it online, and we're going to talk about uh, being how it is to be kept captive under the military regime." Right? And of course, I have no first-hand experience of it, but I can only say that, yes, dear artists, I'm in empathy with you, curatorially. I will give you the carte blanche. Go do what you need to do. I don't know how it will turn up. Uh, just tell me what conditions you need, and I will try to fulfill it. Yeah. And even then, you know, as a, as a presenter, uh, how do you explain this? <laughs> to your audience and even to my colleagues it'll be like dear colleagues just pre be prepared for all kinds of uh, uh, extraordinary uh, demands that the, the 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 group would make you know and please uh, put in more hours because it's going to be online we are the first we were actually almost one of the first uh, uh, projects uh, to test this um, live uh, screen online hybrid format yeah, and so we said, like, dear team, just do your best, <laughs> right? So, you know, but, uh, but how do you, in this kinds of situation, uh, explain the need to support without knowing, right? It's all p based purely on what I, I can say, speculative empathy, right? That you just have to go for it because you know it is the right thing to do. Nobody tells you. Right, but you can sense that it has to be addressed and supported. Yeah. So, so, so that's how, let's say, concretely, I share with you, you know, some of my, some of my ways. Sometimes it's irrational, right? Sometimes you, you, you know, yes, it just is, and you go. And and how, as leaders of institutions, then how do you like? What does it mean in practice when you stand in solidarity with with uh, um, a movement uh, for change or an uh, artist who is uh, like uh, involved with a struggle, for example, or ag like against oppression, for example? Or like, so what? What? Let's talk about like what? What does it mean? You were al already talking about like resources, like more. You, you you need cha you need more resource to channel more resources. Um, what what does it mean to you in practice in concrete terms? Like, 
uh, how how do you stand in solidarity when you are like in an instit institutional mm, you have this position where you are in charge of resources for example or in uh, you can make decisions about visibility or you can like um, you can kind of you can influence um, that struggle or that movement so what how do you do that in concrete terms yeah I guess it's it's quite practical and it depends or or not <laughs> but for me I try to be very practical about it so first of all I try to um, choose my battles um, you cannot uh, fight on all all uh, fronts that's for sure and we all try to do as much as we can um, when it comes to doing a programming or curating uh, I think um, it's quite simple. It's not, I mean, it's often, uh, it starts with the empathy, it starts with the understanding, but then what do you do and how do you do it? And um, I was trying to think when I was, uh, I read your briefing for this talk and I started thinking like, okay, so what, how did I do that? And I was always thinking, okay, so there was always a focus, you know, some kind of a focus, like there was the feminist mission, you know, like um, trying to, to, to fight for the, the visibility of female artists and give them as much platform as the, as the male counterpart seems to get. And, um, and so what does that mean? What did it mean in Finland? What did it mean in Stockholm? What does it mean in Berlin? And some things, some things that, some um, hows, <laughs> how to do it, I have brought from Kiasma to Stockholm and to Berlin. And and um, that consistency is actually quite rewarding because I don't have to every time invent things. I have the exper accumulating experience of like how do you, how do you support uh, women? How do you support uh, young women in the early in the career? How do you make sure that, I for example, of the, um, you know, working with the urban dance, how do you make, how do you support the young ladies there? Because the visibility in that is a very macho culture, as long as people are still in the, in the kind of like underground world, it's very male oriented and it really doesn't really support women. So um, we could do that with Mikael here in, in Helsinki. We could do that in Stockholm with some special projects. And now we have done that three years with Urban Feminism in Berlin, a three-year project with uh, 10 young female choreographers from that scene, supporting their development, offering mentoring workshops and possibility to work with technicians and work in a theater environment to, to somehow develop their skills and their professionalism. But, but that's just one line, and it's like there's different lines that I, I focused. Um, one, some of them are like, you know, thinking about class. <laughs> and and we, we often, in the last years, we've been talking so much about sexual identities and gender issues, and, you know, I'm as guilty as anyone for that, but, but we kind of forgot to talk about class. And cla how does that, um, uh, how does class operate in our sector and in what we are doing? And um, so there's many different things that you can you can choose uh, choose to, to to follow, um, and but I think it's the how that is uh, it's 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 really um, important. Like how do you do that? Because when you have a festival, you have a temporary structure. You have like a limited way of working with communities. It was different in Helsinki when you had we were in Kiasma, and we could do like six years at least with the uh, with the suburb um, suburb uh, project in the in the suburbs to create this connection, work with the youth centers, work with the, with the kindergartens. You, could, you would continually uh, engage with the community and, and offer them what they needed. You, you knew, had your finger on the nerve, you knew what they were wanting and needing and, and you could negotiate this, uh, this exchange. But it, it really depends where you are also <laughs> because your, your means, are, means are different. But some things you pretty much also, I, I'm sure you do, you bring from one place to another that experience that, that kind of like gives you the strength of saying like, okay, this I know, <laughs> Th here I can help. I cannot do this, I'm in a, in a strange environment like Berlin, I'm like a totally unknown territory to, to me in, in terms of performing arts, like no deep understanding of how things work, but I would know, okay, so here I know is a spot that I can, I can maybe try to make an initiate change and, and support a change. And just to ask, uh, uh, how do you choose your battles? How, how is your like, 
Uh, what 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 is that process to you? Just yeah. to continue with, uh, because you said that's what you started with. So yeah. I want to like yeah, I'm, I, I'm yeah. I look chaotic, and I'm very chaotic. Chaos theory is my favorite theory, but I, I I'm very analytical. I really try to look at the con. I use time to look at the context where you work and try to get informants from that environment like in Berlin like really long talks with people like what do you think where can you go in I mean you know there's other people that are doing that so I don't have to do that they are already there they are doing it much better than I so it is about really looking at where you are uh, what is the history of the place which is always absolutely uh, f fascinating especially in Berlin which is such a uh, rich uh, place for history which also affected then uh, my programming you know thinking it's a theater city it's this kind of city you know like what how do you how do you come into the city? It's about looking at the history, the social structure, the political structure, and then then try to to find your way through it. I mean, you cannot you cannot m kind of like you cannot master it, but but you can see find a way like where where you can do the most and not try to do what everyone else is doing. And also, who to do it with? Right? So it's it's not. I mean, choosing your battles also asks you to identify who your alliances are, <laughs> right? Who would be on your side? Who already have the same empathy and sensibility and you just have to build, that, that intensify that relationship of communication and trust and respect and, and, and to push forth uh, that, that, that change, right? So it's like looking for that little crack, right? And exactly. then to push that crack more. I should say that when I decisively uh, uh, turned independent producer in, in, in around uh, 2000, um, I was, um, you know, I was lucky, I think, and, and also maybe I was more sensitive to whom I could speak to uh, or I could lean on uh, that would provide this crack for me to go in through. So, of course, I, I must say, I in retrospect, I'm very grateful to Free Lazen of Kunsten Festival, Bizarre, and, uh, of course, uh, Sandro Lunin, who is leaving, uh, retiring soon. Uh, you know, so, so like, uh, both in Europe and in Asia, for example, like uh, Faith Tan of, of Esplanade, uh, she was always more listening to me uh, than her other colleagues. So, 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 so when you, you when you have these alliances, you start to magnify and amplify, and they, in their own spheres of influence, would start to also instigate others, to 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 by vi vi visibilizing it, they are already presencing it and, and, and influencing others. So I think uh, through the years, that's that's, that's how I kind of worked. I also have a very strong nose for people who are whitists and, and, and supremacists, and immediately I know, oh, no, another of those, you know? And I would just avert. Yeah, although I, I should say that uh, in my journey, I also realized that the dialogue has to be had with these people too. Yeah, but the dialogue must be by example, by, by the doing as example. You cannot just go uh, uh, on a war of words and uh, uh, I ideology. It doesn't work like that. You, it, and the beautiful thing about dance is that you actually manifest it in the body and, and, and as a work and then people see it and then they understand it, the experience and then they know what is the effect. No. I think it's also important to know on what level you're working. Like working on a grassroots level with like young women is one thing. But um, as um, in, in Tanzim August, we also, we, um, I was worried about, because I had big stages to, to put a uh, performance in Volksbühne or Haus der Berliner Festspiel, which are huge stages. And then I looked at what was available, and it's mostly male choreographers who are touring, and there's like five names in Europe who are touring the big stages. And, um, and from there came the whole uh, Big Pulse Dance Alliance, the EU project that we are uh, involved with, um, also with uh, Sidestep Festival from Helsinki and other festivals around Europe, to think like, how do we put diversity on the, our big stages? How do we support artists uh, who want to upscale, who are ready, but who doesn't, who nobody really takes the risk? Because I understand it's always risky to put new, new names on big stage. But at the same time, it, the big stage is where, um, where you can also initiate change. 
because you put there something that is uh, that is not expected. I mean, if if there is a ballet or you know uh, Rosas or any of those who are touring the big stages constantly, you know you get your audience. It's always risky to take new names, but collectively on a European level, supporting this movement uh, makes us much 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 stronger. And I hope we can we can initiate change. And this year's program, I'm testing it <laughs> in real. <laughs> this can go really. This can go really bad, <laughs> of course, but it has to. You have to, as you said, you have to put it there. You have to do it so that you can uh, you can you can really talk about it. But the fact is, to make that kind of change, that's a lifetime commitment. It's not going to change with like one year, one festival, or or even twelve of us putting uh, new names on big stages. It's it's something that we consistently have to keep pushing because the canon is so hard. You know, you put people in the canon, they seem to slip away if they don't really fit that, and and the critics are not for it or something. So, um, so that's another example of like how you can work on a grassroots level or 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 in a European or a global level trying to to work or make change possible. Oh, time is flying. That's that's uh, like now now we uh, there's so much we want to talk about, but I just got a message that we have 15 minutes, so I will have one question um, more before we open up to the audience because it's ah well mm, I want to talk about, uh, well, I have two words here that I really want to talk about, but I don't know if I, uh, if how to connect them, but, um, yeah, uh, Fukuen, you were talking about the colonial awakening, and there's a lot of, like, talk about in art, uh, in uh, education, in research about uh, the, the colonization, uh, but it's like, what does that mean in practice? Because we are talking about practices um, uh, in concrete terms, uh, not as a metaphor, but something that is uh, like that to become a reality. Also, colonization is not an event, it's a process. So it's like decolonization also is a process, but what, what can, can that process look like? Um, and what is the like somehow I want to, what does that look like and what, like, I have a feeling that where we were earlier, we were talking about energy and energy and movement, like that there's a change, Virve, you said that there's like, uh, there's like movement, there's culture, there's community, it's participatory, you were talking about um, that kind of energy that was in the punk, like I'm, I'm thinking of like, like, um, like what what is the uh, the catalyst or the energy for this process of decolonization because i I feel like it's something about talking about the change in big big structural way. I feel like decolonization is really a key because a lot of like like uh, structures that we have in the like the so called like western societies and including the art field is like a product of colonization, like uh, this, like this heteropatriarchy, or like uh, educational systems that are like uh, uh, that are um, uh, co uh, colonized, or or um, that are like uh, uh, st strive for a particular kind of society or economy or or citizen also. Uh, uh, it's connected to racism, it's connected to genocide, it's connected to extractivist, uh, extractivist policies, but it's also like we, all, we have all of that in the art. So I'm, 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 uh, I'm interested if, if like, because that's, decolonization can be like a kind of key for change, I think now, if, if it's taken not as a metaphor, but as a, as a concrete practice. So what, what could that look like? Wow. Yeah, anyway, wow. I think uh, <laughs> in 15 minutes. In 15 you? minutes. No, no, no. Well, I, I, it, it's it's in the programming uh, or curating. It's uh, it's about that the pr inclusive program that you um, that 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 whatever I'm doing, I'm, I'm taking things into account. But in but to initiate change, 
uh, we discussed this in, Kias uh, in, 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 in Berlin with my, with my younger colleague, and I said, and she was asking, how can we educate uh, the, the, the gatekeepers? And I said, you cannot educate the gatekeepers, you have to change them. <laughs> I think wow. it's it's very unfortunate for us who are maybe now in a gatekeeping position <laughs> because it, it, it really is we 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 but, but don't we you have I a quote? You have a quote that you want to share with everyone, no? Uh, Just we had yes. a pre talk. Yeah, I'm not sure if I if I if I agree with that quote because because I, because I do think we, we need to we need to, to change the people. We need to we need to be inclusive that we need to and it's not I said co curate. Don't co curate. Give someone the curational power. The co-curation is a little bit like, I feel like it's like an easy way out of this problematics that we really have to make room for others to take over and, and look so that we get the, the, the other perspectives. Um, I mean, we do what we can in our, what is in our powers, but I think to really initiate the change, a, re a real change only comes when we, uh, when we, like when we share the power. And, um, and I don't know if power can be shared either. I'm just thinking like, is power something that you always have to take? <laughs> that nobody's gonna give it to you. So I'm not sure how this is going to happen peacefully. Um, but when I think of uh, um, uh, the, the discussions now about green policy, this is a good example of how these, uh, um, how we sometimes um, in, in Western Europe just uh, evolve around our own uh, uh, problems. And we talk about green policies. So how, what does the green policies mean for us in Europe? And what does it mean people in Brazil? And, and, and you know, that if we, that immediately when we take that other perspective into play, it changes the game. It changes how we talk about it, And it changes about what we think that needs to be done. So I, d I, I wonder, I don't think we have the solution here. And I think also like system systematically, uh, all these um, um, decolonial um, propositions are often at the end um, circumvented by money, <laughs> by, you know, uh, th that then of course falls back into these boxes that you have to tick, and then policies that are engineered to appear inclusive, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's, it's definitely a very difficult circle to get out of. Um, but uh, so, so, I mean, notwithstanding this, uh, this uh, kind of blanket uh, impossibility, I think uh, at least for me, uh, uh, making visible or to say, look, I know you don't like this, but I just have to put this here anyway because it may be for others. And if you don't like it, don't come. You know, others will learn to like it. You know, because the fact that I keep putting it there means that it will normalize itself. All right? So this norm normativity or renormativization uh, has to somehow happen. Yeah, so at least uh, for myself, you know, I would uh, always make sure that I, I have an undesirable hand that's still playing to make sure that there's some disruption to expectations or to what is available and not. Yeah. Mm. I actually have like a, a suggestion for what was uh, in a previous uh, talk or previous previous talk about like how to change the structures and how to let go of the power or like then this is a, a prop uh, this is something uh, that I didn't invent but uh, a, a, a colleague uh, Delia Barker from uh, from London a consultant of London and <coughs> who was artistic director of um, of uh, the Roundhouse and uh, she was talking about this that what if institutions when they were hiring new directors. I, I hope it's okay to say this. I, I think this is such a great idea uh, that I, I should just say it so that to, to spread, spread the seeds. seeds. Um, if they hired, um, it, like saying like, yeah, yeah, we need these new young directors, but what is the path there? Like, what is the path? What are the stepping stones? So to hire a pair, like someone who will accompany the process, who is uh, experienced, who also maybe doesn't want to have that job, but like uh, could walk someone like uh, from a younger generation 
into that job together so they can also learn from each other in the process but it's also like it's kind of like um like a like that it costs money because then instead of one person you need to hire two people for a period of time and then they can continue by themselves but to have that kind of a shift there i think it was su it's such a great idea thank you delia um for that and i think please take it all into your recruitment processes and now um i would like to ask if there people have any questions we have I'm sorry that we just we thought we have so much time when it's just us now, but uh, one hour goes quickly. If there are any questions or comments or something you want to share, I wonder that about taking one with you. You can also do that inside institutions. I mean, you don't always have to reach out from outside. Right. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's about sharing your capital mm. <laughs> with whoever is there with you. And, and that we as leaders that we, we are coaching the people that we work with and that we share our connections, we share our knowledge, we take our staff with us to places like this or to, to network meetings so that people get sensitized and they, they are learning and, um, and I think I think that's that's really important. And it it it, it, it is about recruiting. But it, even if the the recruiting is done, it's something you can always engage with, you know, like mentoring and and coaching the people around you to to um you know when you're a senior position and you're like the, the pension is there, it's not that far. So you have limited time to really like okay, you want to uh, put forward what you have learned. Not that I like you have to do like this, but the experiences are 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 valuable and to be shared and and um yeah i i agree take one with you but or take the whole staff when you go somewhere so that they can they are exposed to the same discussions that you are so that they have that possibility of learning um the way y you have learned i have learned in networking and in this kind of uh, uh, context a lot and i i do think it's something we can offer our co-workers yeah, to grow also like within the organization, like. Um, <coughs> um, but it is quite rare, though, that when a new director is recruited, that it's someone who has grown in that organization. It's not uh, in a big, especially in a bigger scale. It's uh, like it's more maybe in a smaller scale. But maybe I should speak because I'm entering uh, <laughs> VIT Theatre Garage soon. And of course, my predecessor Sven had already employed three curators within the team. He officially appointed them as, as curators. So then, of course, I see this not as a challenge, right? I, I'm also entering uh, this space uh, knowing that uh, I have to be equivalent with them, meaning, you know, I have to understand and respect what their interests and their own discourses and their own agendas are, and then see how we can all, all be you know, on the same table, and maybe not every project, not every desire would be met, right? but there, there would be this at least this kind of discursive process. And just as, of course, they are uh, d uh, definitely more well-informed than me, and they will be, at least in the first uh, uh, months, uh, they will be my teacher. So I'm, I'm really actually looking forward to that, that they, I, I want to be taught by them, <laughs> you know, uh, because I want to be as, let's say, open and also naive in a way. I want to be, in, in a hopefully, in a good naive uh, position first to absorb you know, before I can process and, and, and really evaluate. So, 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 I think this kind of sharing that we're we're, we're really uh, uh, advocating, and this kind of more lateral and horizontal ways of working, uh, I'm lucky. I feel like uh, finally I would be entering a space that allows this. You know, for for so long I've been under very hierarchical systems, right? Uh, even in Taiwan, where I'm based now and working, it's already a very liberal democracy. But of course, in there are still the ghosts of Confucianism. You know, still when I meet an older person, I have to like, oh, 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 I have to be a bit more respectful by putting my eyes down and not like, hmm, yes, teacher, how can we talk? 
you know? So, so you know, so I, I hope uh, Norway uh, for me and, and the Nordic will offer me this really horizon where I can meet eye to eye and we can be different uh, but also be on, on the same way of uh, discuss discussion and decision making. Yeah, learning, listening and learning and unlearning also somehow like yeah, going back to like change and what we talked about decolonization that that um, like uh, theorists and practitioners of decolonization, um, uh, for example, Eve Took and K. Wen Young, when they talk about like okay, what does it mean? It's like if it means like an undoing harm of colonization, then it means everything has to change. And ever like, how can you change everything? That, but maybe I it's uh, it it's something like a process that you find uh, as you go. You find out as you go. Like that, it, you have to like uh, um, find how it looks like. So maybe it's uh, important to always, when talking about change, for example, to ask, how does it look like to you? And in your context, how does it look like in this particular context with these people that you will be working with? How does that look like that? Because when you will, um, like, it, it will look different, like, in 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 Berlin than it, than it looks in, in uh, or in a German context when it looks in a, in a um, obviously, in even, like, Norwegian context or or let, uh, let alone like ta uh, Taiwanese context. Right, so... Um, but really, is there any comment or some, you know, really yeah. maybe a viewpoint? It doesn't need to be a question, you know? It's maybe also... Uh, do we, do we have time for one? I know, like, we we started a little bit late, so if, if there's a comment still, is somebody wanting to... Um, Okay, let me just share, <laughs> okay, because I'm quite eager I'm, and I missed the previous sessions. I should state that actually this Ice Hot edition is wonderful because 12 years ago, I was first time in Helsinki during Ice Hot. So this is really a gap of a, a span of 12 years. and so oh, 10 years. It was 2012, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Two, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, mm. 2012. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So 10 years now, sorry. And, um, and um, I, 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 this trip, I'm really uh, quite feeling quite, uh, quite sparkly, you know? Like, because the kinds of representations I see from our Nordic uh, colleagues are really... If you bring your Euro, Western Eurocentric lenses, or you bring any kind of preconceived or habitual optics into into as a spectator into Ice Hot now, uh, you will find many of these bodies and uh, the ways they move, the corporality and the kinds of energies and the kind of porosities that they are emitting, really puzzling. Yeah, and I've noticed this, when, and, and a lot of these uh, stagings in uh, in the in the Nordic productions have been very much the audience facing one another. So while watching the performance, you can also look at how, like, ugh, you know, you can see your 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 your, your colleagues from pre-pandemic <laughs> days like sitting there and going like, you know, and, and, and stirring in their seats, and they just they cannot understand or cannot access these representations. So I think for me, uh, this trip, I'm, I'm bringing much more open sensibility and I see the decolonial already manifesting and materializing in these open-ended and connected and surrendered bodies, but also receiving something that's circulatory. You know, but not like making political statements for the sake of like standing for something or embodying something. I, I find these organic, uh, org organic forms and shapes and, you know, even bizarre humour, bizarre humour from Iceland in specific, <laughs> right, really refreshing. And I think it's really connected to an, uh, a, a very already early decolonial tendency by speaking to forces and um, 
agencies and species beyond the human. You know, so I think this is so exciting. And so what shape will it take? I think like in these four intense days in, in, in Ice Hot, I'm already seeing the figures that, that, that are to come and we have to intensify these figures. Yeah. I think that's that's good, like, uh, yeah, welcome. ending. Welcome. Welcome to the Thank region. you for my <laughs> spiel in this last moment. Thank you, everyone.